And, um, I thought what we'd do tonight is, uh, really our main purpose is for you to ask questions, uh, but I thought we'd, we'd start the questioning by just opening up with a few um, and, and just warming everybody up. But by all means, um, most of this next 30 minutes will be devoted to your questions. But I guess I wanted to start, um, I mean, it was a fantastic talk, and, I, and in the spirit of sort of candor, you, you're, you're very, as a director, I've, I've, I've seen you in many interviews over the years, and you're very candid, you're very forthright, you're very frank about a lot of, uh, a lot of issues in the art world and the museum world. So I have one question that's actually about art, and then I have another question that's maybe about controversy around art. Um, but let me start maybe with a question about art. Um, as you well know, there's, uh, you know, the contemporary art market is on fire, uh, it's inflated, uh, it's bloated. Um, but let me just ask you point blank, I mean, what's this all about? Is there really, is, is there really anything good in contemporary art? And I'm gonna be deliberately uh, inflammatory. Uh, should we be paying these prices? Should we care about contemporary art like this? Or is this just some sort of, I don't know, narcissism, some sort of preoccupation with people that don't know enough about art to be discriminating? You can say all of that. <laughs> Here's the positive side though. We're suddenly living inside a culture, it's happened even in my lifetime, where visual creativity has become one of the touchstones to proving that you're an educated person, inquisitive, stylistic, whichever attribute you want to choose. So I think we're, we shouldn't be too critical of one another in saying that it's worthwhile or not worthwhile. What we need to do is seize the initiative and try and show people who might be less interested in visual life, how enriching that can be. And even though I find the computer screen and handheld devices and all that relatively annoying, one of the good things of that also is that information can be brought to so many people in different ways. And I think it's also our opportunity to not control, but to add significantly to people's visual acuity and into their memory as well. The market side of it is puzzling to us because we're poor and they're rich. And the thing that we don't like typically is the herd mentality where I must have one of those same things that all my friends have. So that part is disappointing, but I also want to say to you because I used to live in Pittsburgh and before that in the Midwest, Nouveau Riche always have the same taste, historically, because they're so utterly insecure. And then time takes care of that problem by proving which of the things that they were interested in has validity for the future. So even though we live in an era of hyper, 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 I think we can be happy that artists have good opportunity and that we, in some ways, because of the money, which is a sad way of looking at it, are part of a conversation about who we should be, who we can be, who we are, and why we might be able to do a certain number of things together. I didn't really answer the question. <laughs> so, so you've been quoted as saying that you think of museums as a kind of sanctuary of the imagination you've been quoted as saying that one of the challenges you have as a director is to work with a community that is by definition nonconformist, and particularly I think you had in mind contemporary art. The Guggenheim itself is no stranger to controversy. In fact, there's been controversy periodically, quite famous controversies, I think, that, that have been healthy, I suppose, on balance overall. I mean, Maplethorpe, for example, in the 80s is, is absolutely classic. That's when I was growing up. But even last year in the Art in China exhibition that you touched on briefly, there was controversy. There was a question, there, were, there, were, there, there was an internet campaign essentially to have you remove certain uh, exhibitions by Chinese artists. Um, and I guess what I'd like to ask you is, you know, how did you and your board think about that controversy, work through that controversy, make the decisions that you made? And maybe you could talk a little bit about that since, uh, since I think, there are still artists out there that are radioactive and that will probably be radioactive not only for, um, for your institution, but even for our local ones coming online. Yeah, it was a very, very painful episode. And the trustees, other than Cindy, 
tend to be from a different generation. They didn't know, and I wasn't utterly familiar with this concept of the internet swarm. So we had m hundreds of thousands of people offering very violent uh, interpretations of what was going on. And I should say the principal issue was um, animal rights, exploitation of animals, in particularly one video. So we were caught unaware, and it was a very complicated uh, decision that those pieces should be memorialized with a blank video screen or an empty sculpture, but not taken out of the exhibition. Instead, to be talked about in a different way. And it also provoked a big conversation among other museums. And you know, subsequently, the Whitney Museum was attacked because a white artist depicted a black subject, which in some people's minds shouldn't have happened, can't happen. I think what we are experiencing collectively is that culture, which in my day was a received thing, this is better than that, and this has always been better than that, is today really much more open to uh, interpretation. It's very much a, a mirror of the universe where there's very little hierarchy. So we were caught unaware. We really don't like to think of any artist being radioactive, but I must say at a certain moment when people's lives were threatened on staff, the decision became because of the safety of the staff and also because of the building, because of the way it's constructed, lends itself to danger, particularly for tall guys like us. Because the parapets are only three or four feet high, we weren't keen on having any kind of accident go on, and we think about that on a daily basis. I will think, I will say, I think we're a lot more sensitive now to the consequences of certain kinds of decisions, but I'm keen that the curators never censor themselves over that. It's rather that we be prepared together, and that ultimately we can convince the trustees that what we're doing is well thought out. I would, I would ask you, maybe you're not as familiar with this environment here, but with the government-funded museums that are here, uh, obviously they don't operate with a board of trustees in quite the same way that they do in New York. What advice would you have anyway for, let's say, a museum director of a government-funded museum in particular, uh, if, if controversy should suddenly appear? Do you, do, you, do you have advice for them? How should they... How should they work through that? Well, I do believe there's justice. And I think museum directors and staff who make conscious decisions and feel passionately about what they're doing ultimately prevail. Because in the end, government is quite rational also. So to the degree that a joint set of interests can be overlaid on one another, and that's done through very careful discussion, I, I don't see that there necessarily would be huge friction in future, and I hope not. It's not a good way to demonstrate a unified society. Okay, my third and final question, and audience members get ready, because you're, you're next, is about the younger generation. How do you, as a director and as a former curator, <clears throat> how do you think about um, engaging a new generation into art, particularly art where they, they simply don't have a context, they don't have a background, they may or may not have been exposed at all uh, to this. And, I, and, and I, I ask with a very particular set of interests in mind. In other words, I'm thinking not so much about, you know, how do we just cultivate the next generation of collectors, but how do we actually get to uh, the, sort of the inside of art, the kind of things you've talked about that you'd like to convey, even if people don't have a background. There's a way in which, as a curator, you want to bring people in, maybe engage them in a kind of experience, and leave them with something. And then you've also spoken about how, with younger people, this is a, a, a kind of blossoming that can take years. So seeing an exhibition now may actually blossom 15, 20 years from now in their lives in different ways. I, speak a little bit about that. Just well, that's, that's a crucial point, because I think we should never cater to the idea of novelty and the instant fix. Really the people that were most likely to be our allies into the far future are slow in understanding what it is that they need and want when they look at art. And they spend a lifetime pursuing that. I think uh, I also would caution, and I tell myself this now because 
I'm sometimes a little bit on the bitter side. I'm right on schedule. I'm becoming grumpy. But <laughs> we just made an exhibition in New York about an artist who made very odd and very powerful paintings, 1905, 1906, a Swedish artist named Hilma Afklint. And there are ways that you could argue that she precedes Kandinsky, for example, in looking at abstraction. What's crucial when you look around at who the audience is, it tends to be people under 35. There is a thirst for certain kinds of information. There will always be that thirst. I think our job is to make certain that whatever it is we're doing, we do completely. That's what we call being professional. And then it should be fully socialized so that I don't walk into the museum feeling that I'm stupid or I don't know what's happening or this is only for wealthy older people, for example. Really, our audience, and this is our purpose, I think, is to make certain that every inquisitive person has something that he or she can take away from the experience, and it probably won't be data. We're obsessed with labels and movements and how things happen, but that's not really the way life is for most people. They're only partially interested in the sequence of civilization, but they're deeply interested when you put them in front of something that matters for various reasons. So I want to encourage people to think that really the audience is inquisitive people. They come in all ages and sizes, and our possibility is to make certain that they feel satisfied and that their quest goes on. And to that degree, I would say, frankly, Wright's building, which I used to think was an abomination when I worked in a square museum, literally square, is very much in our favor because it's an experiential thing where you walk up ramps and see things in a kind of different way. It's a true journey. All right, let's open it up for the audience. We have microphones that can float and be available at your beck and call. Here's a question right here. Let's start with... It's actually sort of with your building that I, I want to start. You've... you've uh outlined a very productive tension between the interesting and coercive buildings that the Guggenheim Foundation has built over the years. Um, but I won wondered if you wanted to reflect on, you were also an, an institution which now effectively is, is a collective of buildings. And I was made thinking about the role of your collections and the movement of your collections between your institutions. And I wondered if you wanted to reflect on that as a well, one of, the, one of the charms of working with the Italians is that when we want to borrow a painting that we own, we have to get permission from the Minister of Culture of Italy. So this is private property, but controlled by the state because it's more than 50 years old. We do borrow between ourselves quite a lot. We particularly have an active program with Bill Bao, where their collection is quite small yet. It's fewer than 150 objects. So we make a very concentrated effort to share things on a repeated basis. And I know we will do that in Abu Dhabi as well. I think the inference of your question is more interesting in a way. I think you're trying to say to me, are, are you predetermined by your buildings? That's what I would ask. And I would say yes, and happily so. Well, actually, what I was more interested in is, is this collection at Abu Dhabi, which is going to take a different perspective, is that going to come back and alter your, your kind of programming oh, it and collection? It has hugely already. So as I mentioned earlier, we have this good relationship with the Ho Family Foundation. That gave us a giant insight into redefinition of creativity in this part of the world. The money that we've been given with, from UAE to go purchase a collection has allowed our curators to really go around the world and look at what's happening and be very conscientious about it. And we previously had a program like that with the bank called UBS. I'm sorry to say that in front of your bank, but. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the challenges that we all have together is we talk about globalization and that has consequences and it's real. And the first thing is to recognize that you have to go to the place and recognize the other. And from that comes the communication. I think we've had a history of 
particularly in wealthy American museums, of landing in a place, buying a few things, and then running away. And that's what we were trying to avoid over the last 10 years in particular. Does that answer the question? Yeah, there's a question there. Uh, good evening. Um, my question is partly answered by your earlier uh, answer. Um, to what extent are, is the art in your museums purchased and loaned to you? In New York, it's probably 90% lent. So we have a collection of about 8,000 objects, which is quite small by American standards. And we're showing, on average, fewer than 200 things that we own. So it's a, that's a disproportionate but realistic assessment of what's going on in New York. So the trustees, including Cindy, frequently say, can we redeploy the collection differently? And the curators come up with different ways of looking at what we own. We do buy. We buy very judiciously. We're not the Museum of Record. We're a museum that's dedicated to looking at an artist's career over a long period and buying multiple examples, but only of a few artists. So we, I don't know if this is going to lead to your question of why buy it and then put it away, which is a legitimate question. I, I'd say also, statistically, we're probably the biggest lender in America. So we might lend up to 900 things a year to other museums, which is really quite intense. But I think inadvertently or directly, you put your finger on a big question that museum professionals have today, which is, what is all this in storage? What does it mean? Is it worth keeping? You know, these are questions that are going through a lot of people's minds at present. Or is it worth deaccessioning? Thank you. Another big issue. Well, that we, we do that as well, yeah. Here. Yes. Um, well, thank you for introducing your museum and those you know that uh, will be built. But I have a bone to pick, you know, as a museum goer, because all those photos that you show us, uh, you hardly see a crowd. But these days, whenever you go to a museum, it's so packed. I was recently, you know, in in Paris, London. Every mu uh, museum, I have to queue up. You know, and when I got inside, it looked like you know any uh, sale of a department's uh, store, and it's so packed you don't you don't get to enjoy it. I, I I'm, I'm old enough to remember you know in the old days you, when you go to a museum, you can l almost you know leisurely spend an afternoon there. You know, going from from one piece of artwork to another. But these days, uh, it's totally uh, out of control. How, how do you feel, you know, running a, a museum, say for instance, you know, the, the Solomon Guggenheim in, in New York, you said something about, you know, the danger of people falling over. Uh, I think that is a, that's, a, that's a real worry. Well, I share, your, I share some of your concerns about the museum having become overpopulated, which is real, even in New York, but not to the degree that London and Paris suffer from. So I know it's almost impossible today to go visit a place like the Louvre in Paris because it's essentially become an airport or train station. And I find that disturbing, but I don't know what to do about it, short of giving them more money so I can go in the morning before it opens. <laughs> That's one of the solutions that happens in New York. We try in the Guggenheim to never have more than 3,000 people in the building at one time, which is a lot of people, but it's not unmanageable. So for us, a very big day would be 4,500 or 5,000 people, but they tend to come very much at the opening, and by 2.30, it's thinned out. So I don't know, maybe you can get the app that tells you the good time to go to the museum. Places like the Louvre and the museums in London are overwhelmed by tourists. And tourists have a different rhythm than, than we do. So if you go later in the day frequently, it's much less crowded. I know what you're saying. I don't want to be the person who says there shouldn't be all these people in the museum because that's our lifelong dream. What's sad in a way is that if we like the museum, it's hard to look at what we're there for. 
Could I just add? I don't really have an answer, in other words. It's also very much on the mind of private museum developers who are trying to create something of that old experience uh, less crowded, because the public museums are simply too crowded. I just thought of a, a sort of solution for this, and I just want to uh, ask you whether you think uh, in future holograms and virtual reality might take some of the problem of storage and um, overcrowding out of your museums. I do think they will, and they have been already, but they will be useful complements to seeing the art. and. You know, we've had now 500 years of looking at reproductions of images, very useful, and to use technology to advance that idea is very helpful. But I think one of the things that we're discovering, and we, every generation sees this differently, is there is a need and a thirst to be in front of the thing physically. So I'm happy that people would like to see a hologram of a Mondrian, for example, but I know that other people, and these are the ones I'm more aware of, want to look at the Mondrian as a physical object. And your friend on the road before, our job is to try and make that possible by having the Mondrian set up in such a way that it remains legible. Because also one of my complaints about many of the museums and exhibitions I go to today is it's really quite illegible. I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing it's not being presented to me in a way that I can digest. So for the young curators, that's a challenge, I think. There's a question in the back. Thanks for the amazing talk. Uh, it was Nicholas Sorota who said a few years ago that the future of museums will be between experiment and experience. Last time when I visited Cleveland, I discovered this Artlands Interactive Studio and it seems that there is a trend that um, entertainment and light gymnastics becomes more and more popular in art museums. So we are getting closer to science museums. How do you see the future of museums? Mm, I think the future will be very much like the past. <laughs> I think the concept of a museum is relatively uh, immutable. The thing that we have to offer to one another is trust. You have to say to me, I know that I look at you, I know what you're doing, and what you're doing is helping me choose what's important at present and will be important in the future. And I think that's the central activity. It might be presented in ways that are novel, but that idea of discernment and responsibility towards the thing, whatever it is, remains at the core of what happens there are many ways of, you know, trying to make that more interesting, but typically I find them not so interesting. I think one of the things that happens in today's world is if you have uh, particularly smaller children, very little of what they're looking at is fixed. Everything keeps changing, moving. And one of the great things that a museum offers is the fixed thing. So I can go back and look at that thing over and over again, even as I get older and look at it differently. And that's an important, I think, way to demonstrate to people who might be more ahistorical than we were that there's a continuity in the world, world of civilization. That continuity doesn't always demonstrate itself inside popular culture, for example. There was a question over there, maybe not anymore. Thanks very much for your very interesting talk. Can you share with us anything that you see challenging about New York, such as the visitors or the art world? Thank you. Well, it's... The question is what's challenging about New York at present. It's becoming too homogeneous. It's uh, very difficult for people who, underneath a certain income level to live there in a way that they can tolerate. And America generally is suffering from this fixation with counting. So people are talking about, I have 31 billion, I have 12 billion, I have 16, you have 17. It's this highly quantifiable civilization that's really not 
in the end particularly interesting and won't be long lasting. So New York right now I think is going through a testing phase of how do people on the margins, if that's the way you want to put it, remain citizens, active and happy citizens in a city that's overpriced. It's not overcrowded except in the subways. Hi, my name is Monique Burger. Um, we are private collectors. How do you deal with gifts? You know, you have more and more very wealthy collectors who either build the museums or just have a collection, and what do they do if the next generations mm. don't want to keep all they collected, uh, they have collected? How do you deal with gifts? Well, because we're so small, we really accept relatively few gifts. We like them, but we are very careful about them. At other museums where I've worked, for example, in Pittsburgh, we're much more open to gifts. It's an important activity on the part of the original collector to think that whatever that couple or person did has value into the future. So I think it's noble and should be recognized as a kind of act of nobility to offer something as a gift. Unfortunately, I'd say Guggenheim takes fewer than 10 things every year as a gift. Other museums are much more accommodating. But don't you see also a problem in this? Because uh, when we moved to Asia 15 years ago, uh, we saw all these museums popping up, you know, and they didn't have the software, meaning the collection. Uh, and I grew up in Europe. That's how, you know, our museums started. You had a collection and to, then you built a home. Um, but still, you want to be a collector and we don't want to own a home. And I traveled around Europe and I asked professionals, you know, what do you do? And Max Holland actually gave me a very good um, answer. He said, you know, if you really want to build your own museum as a private collection, you have to think for the next five generations. We like to discourage people from building <laughs> private <Exactly>. museums. <laughs> <coughs> but we have to be honest with one another. When you buy 10,000 of these because you love them, what, what happens when your children aren't interested or your husband or... It's a question of will society value what I valued? It's a very deep question and it's painful, very painful. But I think Max gave you a good idea. If you're making your own place, that should be good for 250 years, yeah. Yes, over there. Hi, thank you. So my question will be about the art world and the auction, actually. So um, as I noticed, um, usually museums don't usually resell art, or they usually collect art for, for the greater good of a preserving of art. But for, for example, or for this time, uh, I actually researched just now, like there is a new um, collection that will be um, on sale on Sotheby's later in Hong Kong, um, which is um, like quite um, um, unique. In my case, like I haven't seen like museum will like dedicate art uh, in auctions like in recent year. Like, what is your view towards um, museums' relationship towards um, auction house like Sotheby's and Christie's, and how? What is your consideration in um, uh, participating in a auction or giving out artwork for uh, for auctions? Are you alluding to the painting that we're selling? I, I don't have that money, <laughs> lah. <laughs> Here's the way that it works for us, and I think this is a good way to think about it. We have a committee of curators and they look at what we own and we sell very little, but we've sold maybe 400 things over 10 years, most of them junk on close inspection. Some very good things also. And the piece that's on sale now is brilliant, but we owned it for 50 years. It was never on view in the museum and it was never asked to be lent by another museum. So to me, that means it's an asset that's hidden and needs to go back in the real world. So we have a committee that looks at everything and then the committee comes to the trustees and says, here's our recommendation. They vote. I recommend with them that this happens. And then we choose to go to the auction house because we think that's the fairest way. It's not really about the money. It's more about... For me, if, it's, if I've had a tax exemption as I have for the last 75 years, when we sell property, it should be available to the widest number of possible buyers. 
So we go to all the auction houses, including um, all that we can find that are reputable, and we ask them, what's your proposal? And we choose with the trustees which one is best, we think, for the object. So what would you spend like with that money? I'm, I'm curious, actually. <laughs> yes. Like, for example, you, you have a new high, because that is one of the highlight piece yeah. of, of that evening auction, for example. Well, we'll probably, I think we uh, found something that uh, we want by an artist from Asia. But the original donor was not a big collector of Asian art. This happened to be one thing in the collection. So I, my suggestion is that we take the balance of the money and put it back into a common fund. We don't spend that much. So we can take the balance of the money and invest it, grow it, and see what happens, what needs to happen next. Remember, this is something that I'm not all my colleagues will tell you, but I'm only the director. <laughs> I don't make all the decisions. I help execute some of the decisions. I'm also part of the de conversation about what's going on, but we live inside a very big collective. So many people have to think about what's best. It's a dedicated function among your curators to be looking at the collection constantly for items to take and out that's, for And that's, I think, a responsible way to deal with the expense of, of uh, storage. We're spending quite a lot of money every year. We have 11 places where we store art, but we only own one of them. So I'm paying rent on 10 others. And frequently, these are things that have never, will never be seen in the museum. So collectively, we're trying to figure out which of those can we put either as a gift to someone or sell to the benefit of the work being seen more frequently. Some of my predecessors made imperfect choices, <laughs> and the people after me will say the same thing. <laughs> well, any final question? Oh, there's one, gentlemen. Hi, once again, thank you for your talk. Um, as you've previously mentioned, what is on display in the museum might be a very small fraction of in the inventories. In particular, I wanted to ask you, how does the Solomon R. Guggenheim New York Museum choose which items to put on public display? And secondly, what are the purposes of special ex exhibitions as opposed to permanent collections? Thank you. Inside a museum, the people who have the most power, if you want to look at it that way, are curators. So they say, or they propose, that someone says, I'm very interested in blue and I'm gonna make either a show from the collection about blue or a temporary exhibition about blue. But for everything that happens in the museum, there has to be an advocate, and that advocate is the curator. So that's the beginning of the process. And that's true also of the temporary exhibitions, and we look at the proposals from all the curators and say to one another, what's the best blend of the ideas that are in front of us where is the scholarship that we can add that's the most important? Because it's not so interesting to write another book about an artist who's had a thousand one-person shows. And we're keen now to try and make a better gender balance. So we're having more exhibitions with women artists, which is a deliberate strategy on our part. But we look at it from the point of view of, is there an advocate? Is that advocate's idea useful in terms of audience and internally? And then finally, what's the result of that activity? And for us, that has to be scholarship, a book, a new appreciation of the artist's achievement. Thank you. All right, well, I don't see any final last minute urgent hands being raised. So what I'd like to do is just take this opportunity to thank our speakers. Thank you for your time, your candor, and your vision. Thank you very much. <laughs>